Thank you so much uh, for joining us for tonight's panel, Design with Intent, a conversation on surface and product design. My name is Kate Firetag, and I'm the Director of Communications and External Relations for the Society of Illustrators, a nonprofit dedicated to the art of illustration. I will be helping with the Q&A portion of tonight's event, so if you have any questions, please add them to the chat or the Q&A section uh, of Zoom. Um, so now let's jump in. Thank you to our panel panelists for being with us tonight. We are so happy to welcome this group of incredibly acclaimed illustrators and designers. I'd like to start the evening by introducing our wonderful moderator, Melinda Beck. Melinda Beck has been working as an illustrator, animator, and graphic designer for over a quarter century. She is based in Brooklyn, where she lives with her two teenage daughters. Her artwork has received numerous awards, including two Emmy nominations and medals from the Society of Illustrators. A series of her political illustrations has been acquired by the Library of Congress for the permanent collection. Recent projects include a series of stamps for the US Postal Service commemorating the 50th anniversary of the passage of Title, is it Title IX? Um, an 80, 80 foot mural from Mural Arts Philadelphia, a series of murals for the teen center of the newly renovated Mid Manhattan New York Public Library on 42nd and 5th Avenue. And she has written and illustrated a children's book entitled We Are Shapes, which will be out in April 2022. So welcome, Melinda. You're on mute, so you wanna. Um, sorry, I'm sorry about the mute. I forgot to turn it off. But um, it's my pleasure to introduce um, the artist on this panel tonight. Uh, so uh, Terry Fry Kasuba is an illustrator living in the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She majored in business at Villanova University and worked in, adver in advertising agencies before returning to Tyler School of Art for graphic design. There, she fell in love with illustration and storytelling. She works in her home studio where she's frequently visited by her husband's two boys and one dog. Um, she has been included in American Illustration and Society of Illustrators annuals and displays her art in galleries throughout the United States. Her clients include Blue Q, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Anthropology, Hallmark Cards, Gallison, Roger de la Borg, and Quarto Printing. Uh, Ilya Milstein is an Australian self-trained illustrator working in New York, employing a combination of traditional and digital processes in a style reminiscent of the Franco-Belgian comics and Japanese woodblock prints. His drawings are often highly detailed, dense with arcane reference, and nostalgic in their character. His work has been recognized by the Society of Illustrators, American Illustration, Communication Arts, the One Club for Creativity. His clients, clients for his drawing include the New Yorker, the New York Times, Apple, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Jason Sturgill is an illustrator, art director, consultant, and artist based in Portland, Oregon. His work, he works in a very in varied roles over the past 24 years of his career. Everything from starting record labels in 1997, working with Modest Mouse, to working in interactive and strategy at Wyden and Kennedy packaging design at Dark Horse Comics and Marketing, and product design at Nike SB. For the last nine years, he's been working as a freelance illustrator and designer, along with speaking engagement and art shows. He works on a variety of projects from branding and small business to packaging and design for international corporations. Vicky Zhang is an illustrator and artist based in Shanghai, founder of the kids' fashion Ning Yi, she received, <laughs> she received an MFA degree from the School of Visual Arts in 2018. You can find her artwork in various industries from children's book, fashion, branding, and product surface design. She has worked with Blackberry, Fila, The New York Times, Gilead Sciences, Huawei, The Washington Post, and the China Silk Museum. Her work won the 19th ADC Young Guns Award, Society of Illustrators, New York, Book Silver Award, and she recently published a picture book, book entitled uh, The Whole World Inside Nan Soup. Um, the first book of her art was published called Red Box. There you go. Okay, so um, I guess we'll just start. I thought we would start with everyone just presenting um, 
the their surface design piece that got into the show and just some backstory on it. So we will start with Terry. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to share my screen. Well, first of all, thank you so much for to Society of Illustrators for even asking me to be here. I mean, I was so um, excited to be in the show, let alone like to be asked to be on this panel with all these amazing illustrators. So thank you for that. Okay. So um, I had two pieces in the show um, this year. The first one is this uh, Boss Dogs puzzle from Gallison. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the um, process um, of uh, this illustration project. So, um, okay, there we go. So first of all, um, like the inspiration that the art director, um, the art director got my promo postcard, which is the two Great Danes um, on the left-hand side. And that was part of a series of greeting cards for Roger Laborde. Um, so those dogs with t-shirts actually came from a, pro a personal project that I started about 2017 um, for uh, uh, a pro promo piece for Icon, it's the illustration conference. And then um, that, oops, that came from, um, sorry, I can't see all of my screen because there's people, the, the, the blocks are here. Um, so that came from when I was pitching uh, work for um, licensing, um, I did this art, you know, board and this little cat, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this little cat I just did to kind of like dress up the board. So that was the start of my like cats and dogs with t-shirts. Um, so anyway, the first, uh, the initial email that the art director sent me was uh, actually had this layout because she grabbed um, cats and dogs from my Instagram um, page or my website. And uh, she laid out like the timeline, the budget, the fee, the colors, the template, like on first contact, which hardly ever happens. But, um, you know, she knew exactly what she wanted. And obviously I knew what to do because I had done these cats and dogs for a while. Um, so usually, you know, there's a little bit more back and forth. This was much less because she knew um, she gave me this layout right away. Uh, and this was the first sketch, so not very far off from the initial layout. Um, we just went back and forth with um, uh, what kind of dogs that they wanted, like what dogs was more popular, what would fit in the space better, like the colors of the dogs. So this was the first sketch. This was the second sketch. <laughs> And then the third sketch, it was basically done. We just went back and forth with copy a little bit. Um, so I paint traditionally. And so I just, and once again, since I knew what I was gonna do, I went basically to final, but because I paint traditionally, I, I, I do everything on layers. So like the background was one layer, the dog was one layer. Sometimes the t-shirt was a different layer. And then the copy was definitely is if ever I do these, the copy is always a separate layer because that is more tends to change more than anything else. Um, and then this was the final. And then I just do usually they ask me to do some kind of hand done lettering and the boss dogs, they need the lettering for the packaging. So um, I did that. Uh, and the second project that I got in the show was a happy cat shoulder tote for Blue Q. And um, like Gallison, I had wanted to work with for a while, but um, had never worked with before, was a brand new client. Um, Blue Q I've worked with for about um, five or six years now. And so, 
Okay, so this, so the happy cat shoulder toe, the cat shoulder toe was the one that was in the show this year. The inspiration for it was the happy dog um, shoulder toe, which was actually in the Society of Illustrators show last year. Um, and as opposed to Gallison, I did tons and tons and tons of sketches. Um, since I had done the dog bag the um, the year before, I, I got a little bit faster to, <laughs> to the solution because I knew they just wanted um, a bunch of different different cats, different poses. Um, I knew I was it was going to be spot color, so I was going to color it in Photoshop. So I didn't really use paint at all. I just used ink to get the outlines. Um, and then, so the previous slide was, I had been drawing on tracing paper, and this is a sample of what I would have sent to Blue Q, like cleaned up a little bit so they could go through and pick which poses and cats they wanted. And um, just so you know, I did a lot more than these. <laughs> this is just like a little sampling. Um, I probably did 10 rounds with them and there was probably like three sketches in each round at least. And like this project took three months, the puzzle project took two weeks. Um, so this is just some color roughs cause I wanted to make sure I got like, um, like the texture, you know, to make the definition of the cat since it was gonna be limited color. And I'm not, I don't usually work in limited color. So this is some more sketches for the layout and how all the cats would interact and the negative space. And this is kind of color roughs, but these are very like, this is all these colors are like pretty awful, but I kind of just try to like, work out the layout. And sometimes I use colors that I wouldn't use in the final project, just so I like don't have to think about color. I, like, cause I know I'm not gonna use those colors if, if that makes <laughs> sense. Um, so anyway, I decided I wanted this yellow background because it had to be coordinating with the happy dogs bag, but not the same exact colors. They had to be differentiated if they were next to each other in a store. So I chose this yellow color and like all along I had the yellow. And so, you know, you first you do the front and the back of the bag, and then you work on the side panels of the bag. And then you, then this page shows like variety for, um, the top of the bag, like different coordinating patterns that might go, you can't, you can't see it on the picture of the bag, but like on the top of the bag, there's the coordinating patterns. And, um, and then the bottom of the bag, you need to like have an illustration that is conducive to putting all like the required type at the bottom of it. And I handed all that type also. Um, but then they said, we don't, we don't want yellow at the, like, at the like last minute. We don't like yellow. So then I gave them like a, three other choices and they, we ended up on this blue color for the, the bag. And that is it. <laughs> I think some, I can't hear anybody else. <laughs> I think thank you, thank you, Terry. there we go. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, Ilya, uh, your turn. Hi, everyone. Um, let me make one last change to my slideshow. Okay, I'm good to go. Um, also, thank you to the society and uh, for having us. And thank you, everyone, for, for watching tonight. That's really lovely of you. Um, I'll get started, I suppose. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. So I, um, let me enter the, it was a slide, slide view, right? Slideshow, yeah. So I had um, two pieces in this year's um, annual exhibition for the surface and product design. Um, this is the first one. It was a puzzle. Um, it was kind of a licensing, like a licensing project though. It was a, a drawing that pre-existed. The process couldn't have been more straightforward or boring. They had a graphic designer figure out the box. I'm not really going to talk about that, but I'm mainly including that just to show like a little bit of a diversity of work, especially because what I'm about to show you is just a whole sea of black and white and red. 
because the main project I'm going to be discussing tonight is my packaging for KFC UK, um, with uh, worked on with Mother London, um, a UK creative agency, and this packaging was di distributed throughout the UK and um, India and other parts of Asia um, at Kentucky Fried Chicken stores. Okay. Um, now that former project that I showed you involved a lot of a lot of my own agency and creative decisions. A project like this is pretty rigid um, when you work on it. Um, as you can imagine, K a company like KFC is is, is intensely protective of their of their of like their intellectual property. So don't want you to mess around with it too much. Like you know, they've kind of refined down to this uh, very minimal aesthetic. Um, also, by the way, am I the only one who thinks that like the bolo tie on Colonel Sanders uh, kind of looks like a small like body, like kind of like a stick figure body? It looks, uh, yeah, thank you, Marilyn. <laughs> um, I digress. Hey, right, I could. I'm not crazy, but I'm a little bit crazy. So basically in a process like this, um, this is like a big project for a company like a KFC and for a mother. Um, and for them, before they were, before they'd like, approach an illustrator, there would be a lot of back and forth between the agency and the company. Um, and like, it almost comes to you ready-made. I had worked on a project in the UK the previous year for a, a charity called Crisis. This is a Christmas project, um, as, as was this Christmas packaging or loosely themed Christmas packaging. Um, yeah, so this is a Christmas project. And, un and unlike most of my work, it employed a limited palette um, using, the, using the red, the branded red of Crisis. I'd never worked on anything like this before. Um, I found making that main illustration on the left extremely stressful and ended up not having a very good time on this project. However, it had a, like, however, one, it's really good to work for charities whenever you can. And two, this project had some visibility in the UK. Um, including to Mother London, who I suppose saw it and thought like, oh, here's someone creating, uh, creating like a dense world uh, with a very limited red driven color palette. Um, it was their idea to turn, to turn like the packaging into buildings. And when they reached out to me, they reached out with this. This was from the briefing document. As you can see, the project really arrived to me pretty much ready made. Um, that's not to say that there weren't creative decisions that I made, I hope, but um, yeah, they, they reached out and said, would you like to do this? We have X, like we, we have X budget and you have 10 days to do the, to do the entire suite. Um, I said, yes, of course, and just hope for the best. Um, I'll run you through quickly just by zeroing in on like one of the buildings. Oh, and by the way, first of all, before, before KFC could commit, I needed to do like a test illustration. The one on the left is the test illustration. Um, and I want to say that despite the fact that this is obviously a very corporate and commercial project, KFC uh, were willing to be a little bit weird. The image on the right is a recent social media post from KFC Spain, in which they're referencing the Goya painting of Saturn devouring his child. Um, you know, KFC is like, uh, they're happy to be a little bit weird occasionally. Um, so to that effect, while I wasn't able to be completely subversive throughout, I'll be able to point to a couple things that I had fun with. Uh, the prevailing aesthetic I like, we kind of landed on going with was this sort of South London one. This is my initial uh, rough, rough draft, um, rough drafts. Um, so while we're based on Google image searches of what architecture in like certain North and South London neighborhoods look like. Um, and yeah, even though, oh, by the way, this test went okay. Um, I knew, I drew this at a scale that was larger than the boxes re would realistically be. Like some of the buildings on the boxes like are only four centimeters tall. So there were, it really isn't room for this kind of detail, but this was just an exercise of sort of showing the kind of references I would have. So stuff like up here to um, acid rave culture in the UK of the nineties and so on. Anyway, moving on. That was an initial draft, a further draft, another draft, a final draft, line work. As you can see throughout, there are these kind of micro changes. And there were things like they decided that this guy in the bottom center, can people see my pointer by the way? 
Um, anyway, anyway, if you, if you can, you can. Um, like this guy in the center, I had him stealing something. They decided that they didn't want to advocate theft. Um, you know, at certain points, like their kind of corporate DNA did kick in and they were like, oh, well, we don't really want to be seen as condoning crimes. Anyway, um, I then moved on to the line work. I work on paper. Here's one of the actual drawings here. Um, and then in color, um, we landed, I, I suggested working in this palette of the red, um, two lighter versions of it, the brand black and two lighter versions of that. I think in uh, both, I think, yeah, um, trying to limit it to six colors. And that's really about it. That's kind of like the long and short of it. Um, now, there were certain things that didn't make the cut. Like I was really committed to, I really wanted to include graffiti. Um, I had it throughout in like all of my sketches. And like, they told me that, um, you know, at the 11th hour, the class, like KFC had cold feet about it. I really wanted to keep some of it in because I felt it gave the imagery a lot of character. They said no, um, left behind was like all of this stuff. Oh, by the way, that's what the drawing looked like in the box. So this is like two inches tall, the imagery. So um, yeah, I mean, probably like a lot of details were ended up being lost in the reproduction. Moving on. Um, so yes, like certain things I wasn't able to do. Like I, and I worked on the files in a way in which the graffiti were on separate layers. Um, uh, what else? Um, and just like another thing, like I decided, I, I think that's maybe like a final point. I decided to do like a lot of redrawing, um, just keeping this box as the example. They decided that they wanted to include like ex extra drawings on the side. And they said, we'll sample them from one of the other drawings. But I think that um, even though it meant like a, like a sleepless night or two, um, I decided to redraw them. So like the line weight was consistent across all of the packaging. Um, anyway, it might look like a, like a very simple throwaway project, but it was two weeks of, re of relatively fast and manic stressful work. And I'm glad that people liked it and that um, I was given this nice shiny medal for it at last week's ceremony. So um, that's about it. Um, Gotta go, thank you for listening. I hope that was okay. Thank was you. my mic on? <laughs> yes. Okay, good. No, yes. Um, thank you. That was great. Um, Jason, are you ready? Yes. Can you, let's see. Let me share my screen. All right. Can everybody see that? All right. Um, so hi, yes, I am Jason Sturgill um, from Portland, Oregon. And thank you um, to the society um, for including me on this panel. Um, one thing that I forgot to mention in my bio that I think maybe is uh, useful for if there's any aspiring illustrators out there is that I haven't been doing that this for that long. It's only been about the last 10 years that I've been illustrating. Um, and I didn't, illust I didn't draw growing up or anything like that. So um, yeah, I think that when I've talked to people before, that's um, been something of interest. Um, so I also wanted to kind of give a little sense of the other work that I do before jumping into the project um, that was in the show. So I do a variety of projects. This is another surface design project that I have done for Muji. Um, but I also do some Branding stuff. This is uh, a logo for um, a clothing brand called Quite Life in LA. Um, and then this, this is a project for Warby Parker for um, their store actually here in Portland, where on the left is the wallpaper that I created and then some enamel pins. And then some more. This is a, another branding project for a coffee company in uh, England called Cherry Coffee. And then uh, I do editorial illustration as well. Um, this is an example of that. Um, so the thing that I decided to talk about in terms of this project, um, I am basically the art director for this brewery uh, here in Oregon called um, Fools and People Farmhouse Brewery. And like a lot of you know people that work in illustration design, uh, working with a brewery in the, in, doing beer packaging was kind of a goal that I had and I didn't really know how to go about it. Um, so uh, 
one of the things, I guess, I guess the way that I approached it was just really trying to involve myself in the beer space. And so we had uh, the Portland Design Week um, that was happening every year. And um, I proposed doing a project um, that involved pairing uh, home brewers with different illustrators and designers here in Portland. So with another um, friend who works in the home, like the beer space and, and working with home brewers, he kind of organized all the home brewers and I organized all the illustrators um, and designers to get involved. And then we did this event at a gallery space, um, had a local label printer sponsor the event and actually had the labels uh, printed just like they do for um, breweries all over the place. Um, and then uh, and then we also had a, a bigger brewery, uh, Widmere uh, Brothers sponsor the event as well, um, who provided the glassware and you could do, we did sampling of the beer. Um, and then so through doing that project, uh, Widmere actually became inspired by, by the project. And when their anniversary came up the following year, they decided to do um, this project where they had 30 beers um, from their history and had 30 different uh, illustrators, designers in Portland pair up with, um, you know, picking a beer from their history. Um, I was invited and, and uh, chose their Pilsner as mine. Um, and so, you know, through that, getting more and more involved in beer industry and then trying to you know, figure out like, okay, I want to do some more of this. Like who, how else can I kind of get involved in the beer industry? And then I found out that there was kind of this uh, social kind of networking group um, that was mainly kind of uh, brewers and other people that were kind of connected to the brewing industry, brewing industry, but there wasn't really any designers or illustrators attending these kind of networking events. And so through going to that, um, and I had another friend that was kind of involved in that, but uh, my name kind of uh, was out there as somebody that was interested in working in that space. And there was um, somebody that was starting a new brewery and they were looking for somebody to help them out with their packaging. And so from the beginning, I um, it, the brewery is called Wolves and People Farmhouse Brewing. And um, yeah, I was sort of asked to be there from the start, design their logo. Um, and then from there went on and um, have done all of their packaging ever since. Um, this is one of, one of the early ones. Actually, this is the first can. Initially, they were doing all bottles and this was the first can that they did. You can see how it looks on the cans. This is actually the can I designed that um, I won uh, a medal from the Society of Illustrators. I guess it's been a couple of years now. Um, and here's some examples of bottles. This is one of my favorites that I feel like a lot of people didn't necessarily see the sort of concept behind it of being this sort of crown zester. Um, image with the grapefruit on top and then the fur needles in the back for kind of all the ingredients in the beer. It's another bottle label. And so uh, this is actually part of the series that I um, entered and um, was recognized by the society for. And it's the sketchbook series. The, um, the owner of the brewery came to me and was saying that they wanted to do this new series and basically came up with the idea of calling it the sketchbook series. And um, really it was kind of a fun approach to um, this project because I just really got to go through all my sketchbooks and, and I didn't have to necessarily create anything new for it. Um, so I just kind of went through and found some of my favorite illustrations from my sketchbook. This is actually um, drawings that I did of my dog. Um, I had you know, several pages of just drawings of my dogs. So that was the first one. And this is the whole series together um, so far. Actually, there's been more that have been released since then. I think we're up to number seven. Um, 
And this is another one. And these four were the ones that I entered into the show. Um, this one came out afterwards. This is another more recent one, which is one of my favorites. Um, and actually, I think that's all I have in here. So hopefully that gives a good sense of, of sort of how I got into the beer industry, which I think people are curious about. And um, yeah. Great. Um, that's great. Um, Vicki, you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, so let me share my screen. Uh, okay. Okay, so you can see it. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Vicky. It's very happy to be here and uh, I just, uh, I'm so amazed by the previous three uh, artists. They share their work and I really like it. It's very inspiring. Um, so today I'm going to share my project with uh, Media. It's a toy brand. So this year I have two pieces uh, in the annual exhibition. So it's, um, it's a forest party. It's the first one, it's the second one. And they both came into this box. It's a level up puzzles for kids. So the level up means um, it will get difficulty to will get more pieces. And so the kids can challenge themselves from like level one to level six. So what I'm doing is level six here. Uh, but unfortunately this one, I don't have much photography of this, um, this product. So I choose to share another project that I did with the same client. Um, so here's a brief intro of the, my part uh, of my clients. Media is a toy brand who owns like multiple products, like lines of puzzles. And they reach out to me for customized illustrations for puzzles designed for kids. And I have contributed like several works to them. So when I'm doing the, the artwork that I'm sharing today, I actually quite familiar with like what they, what they need from me, their brand DNA. Uh, and also um, a brief story of how I, met my client is he is my friend. Uh, we knew each other because we are, because uh, I'm also a founder of a kids fashion brand. So all the entrepreneurs in China, we kind of like know each other. And uh, so we know he's building um, a toy brand in China and we kind of, um, sometimes we share our opinions on like entrepreneuring, building a company. So that's why we know each other. So this is the first project we work together. It's, um, so you can see here is the logo, here is Nian Yi, it's the, the kids fashion brand I built. Um, it's a collaboration of two brands. So we want to um, both like promote in the, during the Chinese new year. And uh, so here we have like puzzles in this box and as well with, goes with red pockets and the pinks. Yeah, it's a very lovely um, collaboration. And uh, here for, um, for this one, uh, we wish to make um, like a puzzle, focus on the Chinese culture because most of the puzzle we have here is um, maybe on the subject on the Christmas or um, like animals, like terry sharing. Uh, we barely see any puzzles like um, like reminds people of like some Chinese stuff. So that's why we try to do this. Um, now here is a brief timeline of this project. Um, so I will do research and present them the thing I'm going to do maybe a day. And the first sketch, two days, it's very like comfortable times for me. And we're gonna discuss a little bit and then I would take two days to refine it. And then it's my ink join two to three days and we will do the color test and then we go to the final so it's maybe like um in two weeks we can get this down and here's my research i'm just trying to find some like symbol and vocabulary of what's a 
China means to me. I mean, I'm come from China, but how to introduce uh, the culture I'm familiar with to um, to like uh, foreigners. And so they asked me to make this product. The first sign make me remind them of China. So I'm picking up the things that's kind of like um, well known to the to the foreigners, like a kite and the China and the Peking Opera. And then I'm just trying to play with this symbol, this vocabulary, um, in a playful way, in a creative way. Because um, to me, I don't like to do things like too straightforward. Um, I wish something like um, reminds people like mm, out of this the, the object itself. So they kind of, then they choose the sketches from the right side. The first is uh, Peking Opera, but also mixed with um, the character, um, the rabbit character from Beijing. And the second is a kite. It's kind of collection of all the kites in from China. And then the second round of sketch I usually do on my iPad. So it gives me uh, more freedom to adjust it and also keep the image clean. Mm -hmm. And that's here, how I do this. And then uh, when we say we can go with the final art, I will do the drawing traditionally on paper. Um, I like use knit pen because that's good, uh, the drawing, um, you can change the nib to use different lines in different thickness and softness. And sometimes I were doing an extra touch with a brush. And then when you scan it, you will get an image that's not that digital way, but um, still keep um, like a water, kind of looks like a watercolor because it, you still can have a lot of like um, stroke of brush here. And here is his, um, my inspiration from the color. I really like um, the Chinese traditional wooden block. Uh, it has limited color palettes, but it's also um, that you can see that they use the red and the blue a lot. They just have a very uh, classic um, like color set. Usually the orange come with orange, uh, no, orange come with blue green and uh, also like a yellow come with red. So that reminds people um, like a mood of Chinese. So that gave me a lot of inspiration and I bring it to this artwork. So um, when I'm doing this series of work, I, I wish it can give people like a modern sense of wooden block. So I use this pop-up colors, um, but um, the drawing and the composition, um, I actually learned a lot from the modern children's book. And so I give the clients an option of how I'm doing the background color and the foreground. The kite, should I do in uh, like a red and white or red and blue? So these palettes are all I got from um, the wood block printing. And here is a final art. Well, actually um, when I down the, the final art, they will put it in uh, the format. And uh, actually uh, we changed the ratio a little bit to make it like wider. Um, so I do some extra join. Yeah. It happens sometimes in the, for the puzzle because um, you have to fit the pieces and you can see it's a level up product the piece is getting, getting up. Um, and then this is my favorite. It's, so each box they have like three image in one. So here is another, so here is two um, set of work. I worked with them. So one is focused on the Chinese traditional color. Another one is Chinese art is with four in it. And so they put the three or four little boxes in like bigger package. So I kind of have some like um, 
tips for service design for kids puzzle. Uh, so Cindy have to be like kids friendly. Um, and the, the color tom, it should be like bright. So make the, the kids engage in it. And uh, you have to avoid like too much blank area, area because adults can figure it out. But for kids, it's a little bit hard to put it together. And the, the image on the left is actually another product of work recent. I really like um, they put, they make a pin and they will give you the glue. So you can um, glue your, Im your puzzles into like a fixed image and frame them. And uh, here it is, that's it. Thank you, Vicky. Okay, I'm rest. <laughs> um, okay, let's do share screen and cute. Okay, so the project I am going to talk about is a series of murals I did for the Teen Center at uh, the Mid Manhattan Library. Um, for those of you who know it, it's the it's the library across from the main library in New York where the lions are. Um, so usually the first, oh, I should do the, it, it was a very complicated, it was probably one of the most complicated projects I've ever done. Um, and it went over two years. It was actually years worth of work, but it went over two years because of the pandemic. Um, so here's a quick breakdown. Uh, it took me about a week to put together a bid for the project. I had to bid against other illustrators. Um, then about three months later, I was awarded the project. Um, there was some research involved that that was about two months. Um, sketches went over three months. And again, I'm not working on this solely. I'm working on this along with all my other projects. Um, drawings took six months. Final art took three months. Then the project, then March 2020 hit and there was a six month shutdown followed by um, an installation in the summer. And then the library fully opened a whole year later. So usually the first thing people ask me about a project is how did I get the job? And um, I got this job by swimming in the middle of winter in Coney Island. <laughs> um, I, swimming is a thing I do to take a break from doing illustration. I swim on a team. Um, I swim in the summer and the winter at Coney Island. And um, the swimmers who I swim with in Coney Island do races and uh, they asked me to do t-shirts for the races. And if any of you do races, you know that t-shirts for like running races and stuff are usually kind of ugly. So I was like, I'm gonna do t-shirts and they are not gonna be ugly. And um, one of the swimmers I swam with and still swim with uh, works in an architecture firm, Biner, Bender and Bell here in New York. And one of her colleagues was looking for illustrators for the library job. And she just happened to walk by his desk and she's like, I know an illustrator, she does our t-shirts. They're kind of cool. And that is how I got in the mix to put in a bid on this project. So it didn't get me the project, it's just how they found me. So what is a bid? Um, I have to do these sometimes for larger projects or mural projects. And these are also called RFPs or requests for proposals. So if a client asks for an RFP, it's a bid. And it's either a presentation or it's um, a bunch of stuff they ask for you to put in a PDF and send to them. And they're all slightly different. For this one, they asked for five samples of my work. So I picked jobs that I thought were related to this project, um, a bio or a CV, depending if you're an illustrator or an artist, uh, three client recommendations. For the client recommendations, always contact them first and ask them if it's okay. Um, I had to give a budget of what I would charge. So that was part of concerning me was how much I would charge and do a schedule for the project. And my budget is broken down by the schedule. So if for some reason, the project is killed either at the sketch phase or somewhere in the middle. They know exactly what to pay me up to that point. Then there was some terms and conditions like um, what was the usage for the artwork? Because you're always paying for usage, not for the everything. Um, and the usage for this project was on the murals at this specific teen center. And then um, the library also requested if they could throw in if they ever do any sort of um, stuff that they sell, if they could put it on that. And I said, yes, since it was such a large project. Um, and then um, the other thing they asked for was a thing called project description approach. And this is kind of like writing a college essay, but instead of being like, why should you let me into your college? It's more like, why should you hire me for this project? 
Um, so I was just really spoke from the heart. I grew up in New York City and I used to go to this library when it was kind of a dusty old library. And I really loved being a teenager in New York. It was, you know, New York is just the whole world is here. And it's also artistically a very inspiring place. Like I got to see the birth of rap and the punk rock scene in the Lower East Side. And I used to take the subways up to school and I would see Keith Haring's actual drawings like chalk drawings. And I just really wanna talk about how I found Nick so exciting that I raised my teenagers here. And I kind of wanted this project to be a celebration of being a teenager in New York. And um, that's what I wrote and uh, I was awarded the project. Um, so there's a lot of, with a complex project like this, there's a lot of clients involved. So I met with all of them individually. First, um, I met with the architects. There was actually two architecture firms, Biner, Bender and Bell, who were the build architects. And then the design architects was Mikano, um, which is a European firm. And buyer and Bell those were the ones I dealt with mostly. Um, they give me, they gave me um, a blueprint and the red marks show where the murals will be. Um, they have a computer generated walkthrough of the space. Um, and then they had some of the furniture they showed me. And one of the most important things about the furniture was this long snaking colorful couch. And that would be kind of an inspiration for some of the murals, specifically the color. Um, did a site visit. And these are really hard because it's really hard to tell what the site's going to be when it's in this state, but it does give me some idea. They're like, this is going to be here. That's going to be there and because they're architects. They can see, but I couldn't totally see it. And I was like, yeah, uh-huh. Uh -huh. um, then it was important to uh, meet with the librarians um, and the librarians that run the teen space. And they were nice enough to have some teens come in and they had them fill out little cards of things they were interested in. So it was like um, world hunger, global warming, um, pizza, something and girls. I think that's comics, pizza, comics and girls. Um, the diversity of New York and, um, and some of the, I took pictures of some of the art that was on the wall of the temporary space, like draw a representation of the current state of the world. And there's a lovely pile of poop. So, you know, teenagers kind of, they're funny. Um, they don't mess around. I kind of wanted to do art that reflected their aesthetic and their take on life. So after I did all this, I kind of collected it into a little report, which I presented to all the different parties, just to say, these are the things I'm emphasizing. You all kind of have different agendas. Um, are you on board with what I'd like to do with the murals? So from that, um, I did sketches. It was hard to do different versions of all, all of the murals. So what I did was I just did a generic wall and I just tried different things like different combinations of books, New York, teenagers. And we, I presented these and we just talked about what was working better, what wasn't working as well. And from that, um, I refined it into um, final drawings. Um, and there was, yeah, there was back and forth for little items like, um, I did put in the slice of pizza, but we had this discussion about like bagels and hot dogs. Like if you're doing yours for teenagers, don't put bagels and hot dogs on there because they would interpret it um, uh, a little bit differently. So, um, so that was that. And then um, because it was a library, I wanted the murals to connect with a narrative like a book. And as you walk through the space from where you enter at number one to nine, um, the, whole, the murals tell a story. Um, there was color, did some color options, um, and then the final artwork. And the final artwork is done in Illustrator. And the nice thing about Illustrator is it's all vector graphics, which means I can print it the size of the moon or postage stamp, it will always be clear. I spec'd all the colors using the Pantone matching system. So when it was created in vinyl output, um, the person who's doing the output and I could have real discussions about the exactness of the color. This is the color proofing stage on the vinyl. Um, installation, it was important for me to be there on the installation because some of the colors ended up being messed up like that globe teardrop here should be green and blue. So I was there to point it out. So some of the pieces had to be reprinted and re-put up. Um, so here's the final, the final library and the final pieces. Um, this is the library for any of you who recognize it from New York. Um, the teen space is on a lower level, so it's kind of in the basement. Um, as you can see, there is the snaking couch, and you can see the colors are actual Pantone matches to the colors on the couch. 
So when you first walk down the steps, the first thing you meet is the teenager. And teenagers carry, they come here after school and they carry their world in their backpack. So I wanted to show all this teenager's interests coming out on these little snaking tendrils. And um, teenagers come from all over New York to go to this library after school. So the tendrils, and they take the subway. So the tendrils are kind of related to the New York City subway map, those different color lines. Um, oh, and there's a slice of pizza right there. The next thing you see, first you met one teenager, and now we pull out a little bit, and this is a group of teenagers. And the thing about New Yorkers is we walk on these super crowded streets, but yet we all never bump into each other. So I wanted to kind of do this interlocking kind of choreographed dance of walking on the streets of New York. And also, um, I took the subways a lot as a kid, and I was very influenced by Wild Star Graffiti, which are, if you've ever seen it, it's all these interlocking letters. So these characters are inspired by that interlocking, um, the interlocking letters of graffiti. And in here also their backpacks are turned into the objects of the things they are interested in, because you really go to the library to kind of discover your interests. Then um, the last piece on the wall is as you, as the teenagers carry the world in their backpack, books carry the world within their pages. So here the tendrils, all, this, all the imaginary stuff in the book is coming out for the teenager to read. As we turn the corner, there's two breakout rooms. Now, because this is a windowless basement, I didn't want them to feel that way. So I call these rooms the parks and they have the tendrils turn into vines with little leafy growths on them. Also, um, so it also relates to Bryant Park, which is right behind the libraries. So here are the big teenagers. And then in these rooms, the desk is between their legs. So when you're sitting at the desk, you're also sitting like the teenagers are sitting on the buildings. The next breakout room. And then the final room is the full pullout. Like this is the windows on the world view of New York. And teenagers, like when they sit around, they kind of like, they sit in all these kind of funny positions, reading books, like they kind of just like slouch around everywhere. So I had them slouching on all the buildings of New York. And it was just to remind them that they, this is their city to explore and to enjoy. And I put in some little things like, there's the F train, the pizza. Oh, you can't see it there, but there's a pretzel factory, uh, the Chrysler building, the Empire State building. So really a celebration. And also one other thing was there's a lot, I put a lot of white space in these murals because again, they're in a basement. I didn't want to overwhelm the space with too much color. I really wanted to, you know, I really think about where my murals are going. So um, another thing you can do to get more work is do a really good job. And I really worked hard on this and I got along really well. I really enjoyed working with the, the people at the library and the architects. And they were like, um, we're doing window graphics. Could, of lions, could you help us with that? And I was like, yes, I can. So these are two lions I created because they wanted to brand it along with the library across the street. And it's all their top 100 books in, um, I made it a calligraphic lion. And if any of you do letter spacing, this was kind of a kerning nightmare, but worth it because it looked cool. And it also led to another, one of the other mural jobs that got into the side illustrators. This is from Mural Arts and it's an 80 foot mural in Philadelphia. And that is it. So I am going to stop sharing. Uh, let me just close everything. And I would like to ask everyone some questions with the 20 minutes or so, 15 to 20 minutes we have left. Um, okay. Yeah, one question in the Q&A, which I saw Ilya answered um, on the chat, but I think for the group, I think we could ask it again so everyone can hear. Um, so the question was, uh, what time of year did KFC reach out about the project? And curious how far ahead of the season they worked. Um, I, I actually did respond to that in the Q&A in addition to the private chat between the hosts. Oh. Sorry about that. Um, I did that later, but um, for anyone who didn't see, that was in June. Um, thanks for asking, Amy. Yeah, I mean, I think that just like logistically, um, you know, print lead times tend to be quite long. And although a company like at that scale had like, 
is a pretty well-oiled machine. You know, they were printing like probably millions of these units and then needed to distribute them all like all over these markets uh, to be released roughly around the same time. So I suppose they needed about five or six months um, of lead time. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, a question for Jason, which platform was the social media group for beer labels? Oh uh, yeah, so um, sorry for the confusion on that. I probably misspoke somehow, but it was actually just uh, a live kind of, um, I, they organized it over email and it was before the pandemic and we met in person. Thanks, Jason. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, Marita asks, how do you approach designing such a large mural? Uh, this is for Melinda. How mm. much do you scale down and how do you test? How do you test to see how this looks in real life? Or is it a leap of faith? Um, I think the best way I could tell was doing with those computer mock-ups of the space, like putting it in, the, in those, like in Photoshop. That was the way I told, because there's no way I could really print it out, something that's 20 feet. I mean, that would be a lot of eight and a half by 11 pages to put together. So I just did it by um, putting it in the computer generated mockups of the space. Um, and then for all of the panelists, these large corporate projects, how do you determine your pricing? That's for everyone. Um, I can answer that. Um, when I have a project that's specific and kind of strange, like I had to do a shopping bag for a supermarket, I asked a friend who had just done a shopping bag for a supermarket. I think illustrators are very open about what they get paid for things. And it's, I always ask a friend who's done a similar project. Yeah, I concur. I think that's like excellent advice. Um, Sometimes, um, like in the, in the case of my KFC thing, like they brought a price to me, including a full brief. It wasn't a competitive project at all. Like that was a rare thing where, you know, they had little time, but I think they wanted to work together and they, effect they essentially made me an offer I couldn't refuse. But when you are asked to provide a budget, yeah, confer with friends and like always aim high, you know? Um, and indeed, like very often, if someone names a figure, don't be afraid to respond with another one. Like more often than not, a budget is the start of a conversation rather than like a definitive end. So, yeah. I would also add another kind of good resource, which I, I think needs to be utilized more in terms of like illustrators knowing about it and designers. There's this website called lightbox.info, L-I-T-E-B-O-X. And people, you can anonymously um, basically post what you get paid for for certain projects. So you can kind of see a variety of things. Um, my project was not for a giant corporation. It was, you know, for a small brewery. Um, so, you know, the, the prices for all that kind of stuff changes. And you, and you, you can see on that website um, sort of, the, the scale, I mean, I think a lot of it comes down to there's different sort of ways that you can look at each project and it's like, how much freedom do you have on the project? Like with the brewery, I have lots of freedom. I kind of view it as an art project and they let me do whatever I want. So for that reason, I charge them a lot less than I do other clients. Um, but typically I just, I have like a daily rate or an hourly rate. Um, and sort of, I go from that. Or if we're going around, um, <laughs> I basically do the same thing. Like I have a core group of illustrators I talk to um, regarding pricing, but if it's something like specific that, even if I don't know, so say somebody else did a puzzle for Gallus and um, I'd reach out to somebody else who who also uh, did a puzzle or maybe worked for Gallison, even if I don't know them, I feel like, you know, with social media, I feel like I'm like friends with people I'm not, I've never met, but you know, like you have that relationship. And um, I always say to them, like, you can come to me and I'll try to find somebody who also, who worked with that company. So I do feel like illustrators are very, um, uh, good about supporting each other, at least the ones I've met. 
Okay, my turn. Um, I feel like uh, I kind of have a standard, a list of my present list. And really, uh, if I work with puzzles, toys, uh, April, I will go with like advance and uh, royalty. That's the way I prefer. And um, sometimes I will take reference to the, some of my reliable clients. Usually their uh, budget is reasonable. So I will know, okay, so that's how the market price the illustration um, or the project in this way. Um, yeah, so I will, uh, and also like talk with my uh, classmates or um, illustrator friends to see what kind of um, price is fair. Yeah. So it's really, um, when you work more, you will have better idea of how to price your work. Actually, Kai, I had one more thing that I do. I use an app to track my hours on projects, which is something from when I used to be a graphic designer. I mean, there weren't apps then, but, um, and what I'll do is I'll look back and see what I got paid and how many hours it took. And it will tell me what I made per hour. So when I get a similar project, I know how many hours it's gonna take. And I'm like, do I, how much do I really wanna make an hour for this project? And I kind of balance that with, again, how much freedom I get on the project and how much I wanna do it. And how important is the client's, like if it's a nonprofit and it's a cause I really believe in, I'll go for a much lower hourly rate. Is there a name of, uh, for the app that you use? Um, I've got, I've been using it. I think it's uh, here, Hours Keeper. Hours Keeper, interesting. So I, I clock in and clock out on my phone, which oh. <laughs> it's a little so, crazy. Um, I just want to add to that because um, Vicki brought up like license licensing stuff. So when you're pricing something, um, so, you know, that you can have a flat fee, you can have an advance plus royalties, and all that comes into play, like um, sometimes even for licensing, they said, we'll give you a flat fee or royalties. And like, once again, you're like seeing how big of a company it is, how many are gonna be sold, like, and how long it's gonna be sold. Um, for example, Gallison licensed those dogs, but it was only for a 500 piece puzzle. So in, in theory, if another puzzle company said, we want to license it for a thousand piece puzzle, I could do that. Or if Gallison wanted to make a thousand piece puzzle, they would have to come to me and I would, you know, charge them more money for the thousand piece puzzle. So um, in licensing, it gets a little bit more, um, you know, you if they don't give you like the flat fee you want, then maybe you can negotiate royalties or you can negotiate how much time they have the artwork before they have to like re-up the contract. Oh yeah, I think Terry uh, raised up uh, a good point. So usually if I go with license and royalty, I will look up their website or where they're gonna sell their products to see uh, usually how many products they can their sell record. And um, and also I'm interested, I have a question for, for you guys, like how you learn the licensing like contract details. I mean, for me, like when I just began my illustration career, I have no idea of this licensing. I always go flat fee and, or sometimes I go to licensing. I don't know, like um, if I license you, can I license to another client, but they do the totally different product they go or they sell in another country. And until one day I I found a website called Business on Illustrations or something. And I began to realize, okay, I actually can make more profit from like one artwork. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel that like part of the process of developing a career is making a couple of catastrophic mistakes early yeah. on. Um, and I think that judging on everyone's reactions, like we all have a couple skeletons in our closet. Um, yeah, in my case, I don't know. I think that like also the duration of the license, like uh, when you start out is really important as well. Um, because I don't know, I mean, for example, I just licensed a project I did for like an ad, for, like an ad campaign three years, like it was a drawing I did three years ago. 
I gave them like an 18 month license to the imagery. And once that was over, like it was, I was free to do whatever I wanted to do with it. And I just, and I just licensed it for like an installation in a Zurich for like a, sne for like a sneaker uh, convention, whatever that is. Um, <laughs> people are apparently into those things and who am I to um, tell them off? Um, and yeah, I mean, with a couple of little edits to remove ref references to the original company, it was like a way of, you know, being able to worry a little bit less about rent without needing to do a, like another very detailed drawing and like, you know, uh, that was a rambling answer. I hope there was something in there. <laughs> and I think being very, I'm always very specific about the usage and the related as related to the price. And I make it as narrow as possible. Um, being like, if you want more, that's going to increase the price. And that has always paid off. Like either the client has come back with additional uses or again, the piece is resold at a later date after like an embargo period to a completely different client. Yeah, under no circumstances ever allow anyone um, to own your work um, other than yourself. Uh, like, I don't know, like uh, I, at the very most you can do like a kind of indefinite license, but it needs to be a license on agreed upon terms, you know, like you can't let someone uh, run wild with your, you know, with like your, with your babies um, would be uh, my advice. I don't know. What are the so, um, Go ahead. Go ahead, Terry. Um, I was just gonna say um, if, uh, you know, I think it's good to like push back and like that's part of an illustrator's job is to in the be beginning to like read the contract, say, what is this? I don't understand it. Or why is this in here? Because a lot of times, especially with bigger companies, they just put like the kitchen sink in that contract and you have to like cross stuff out. And um, I mean, I've signed contracts that uh, I shouldn't have early in my career. And then you, you know, you just learn that you really got to stand up for yourself. Like, it's not like this is going to be the last illustration job you're ever going to have if for some reason you lose it. And most of the time you don't lose it. You just have a conversation. Yeah, the contracts are written by the art director who wants to hire you. They're written by some random lawyer in the back. And like, I've, I had once in a contract, like, you will do this one quarter page illustration for a women's magazine. You agree to never work for another women's magazine. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but like, and I was like, you read this. The art director was like, yeah, just cross that out. So the art director is really okay with you crossing stuff out. Like they're showing it to you. So you read it and cross out crazy stuff that the lawyers and the company put in. <laughs> Those, that, that um, there's some good questions on the chat that have to do with this. Uh, one person's asking if you have licensing lawyers, and then somebody else is curious if you have uh, an agent or are you represented by somebody or have has been in the past. Um, Anyone with a lawyer? <laughs> I don't have a lawyer. <laughs> I will say my brother's a lawyer, but he's a different kind of a lawyer. So the one time I showed him the contract, he was like, they can't do this. They can't do this. I'm like, I'll never work again. <laughs> like, I just need to make some concessions. But um, no, I've never had a licensing lawyer. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm not that paranoid quite yet, but like, I don't know, <laughs> perhaps like if you if you get really stung once, like then you uh, lawyer up, I don't know. Has anyone has anyone here ever worked with lawyers like just consulting them on like paperwork or I have neither an agent or I was a lawyer. Ever, I'm sorry. I think if I was ever doing a book contract, I would have someone look over it who wasn't me. Those are much more complicated, but the rest is usually three to four pages and the stuff is so obvious that's kind of crazy. It's easy, like if you can read, you can pick out the crazy. Yeah, yeah, and it takes a little bit of lateral thinking to be like, I don't know. I mean, I would suggest to anyone, like, I think like Melinda's advice is great. Like never be, like never think that like the art director is like emotionally attached to their paperwork. Like, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions about it even if they seem like slightly weird ones. Like uh, it's better to figure things out and just be sure you're on the same page with, with everyone. I do have an agent though, um, to answer that question. Um, I'm not sure if there was like any 
I don't know if, uh, <laughs> if like if there are any like related questions to that, but I didn't work with an agent on this particular project. Um, but I now, but my agency now has an office in the UK. So ostensibly, if that project were to have happened now, it would have been with my agency. Um, they're great, you know. I mean, I think especially for someone in my position, I, as like an immigrant, having um, my my agency works as my sponsor, my visa sponsor, which is like obviously indispensable. Um, and you know, it's like like really any kind of professional relationship, like. Uh, you know, like the relationship you will have with a client, um, you need to make it work for you to get the most out of it. Um, and there's a lot of trial and error, but if you work with an agency, you have your interests at heart and you like uh, communicate often enough to like make sure you're on the same page about like your wants and needs from each other at a certain point in time, it can be a really rewarding relationship. Um, yeah. Uh, so I just share a book that I feel like read, I read and very helpful to me. I don't know if any one of you read this. It has like a lot of contracts and it also have a, like a, a brief introduction of some like um, some rules in the um, the contract that we will run into, run into frequently. So I think it will be helpful. I don't have any licensed lawyers, but I learned a lot from this book. Hope this will be helpful. I have a question for everyone. Um, all of you have worked on so many incredible projects and kind of dream projects. Is there anything you haven't done in this area of uh, surface and product um, that you'd really like to, that you consider as like a dream project, like a white whale? Um, I want to work for like a really high end brand like Gucci or, <laughs> or like something like that. <laughs> oh, I can imagine your work on the Gucci brand. Like, <laughs> it's perfect. I, I, after doing murals, I say I'm kind of the opposite. I want my, I want, I like, I love doing work for other New Yorkers, like regular people. Um, it was really what I enjoyed. Like, I feel like, to see art outside of museum, please, you know, for people who don't go to museums, just to see it on the street, just for regular people to see it, that's really kind of my ideal client. I mean, my ideal audience, I should say. Um, and just always clients who let you, give you freedom are the best. Yeah. I have another uh, question. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm just curious, if like Vicky and Jason, if there's anything. Um... Yeah, I think uh, for me, I've, I've been wanting to do kind of bigger agency work. I mean, similar to you working with Mother, um, kind of bigger projects and outside of the U.S. would be great as well. I think it's it would be interesting to do things overseas. Yeah. Okay, to me, I would like to do, I don't know if it's like included to survey design or book design. I, cause you know, like Penguin Learning House, they really have a huge collection of books that they printed on the fabric. I really want to do something like that. Like a whole collection. And they use like um, various materials, not just printed on the paper. Yeah, something like literature stuff. Cause I really into books. By the way, Melinda, I just wanted to quickly say I was walking by uh, by like the second public library building with my girlfriend the other week and um, saw saw those lions without realizing they were yours. And we paused to like really admire them like they're brilliant. I was um, even despite like it, like it took me until you sh you showed them in that slide to actually put to put that together that you made them and uh, congratulations on that whole project. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We love those lions. <laughs> um, oh, Another uh, question in the chat. Do you or do you, did you have mentors in the industry and what was the relationship like with them? Um, so I kind of, um, so I went to business school and then I went back to school for art school. So I was kind of out of like the whole, um, like college uh, uh, 
loop, I guess. But um, so I'm like a huge fan of illustration and art just to, um, in general. So I would go to like art galleries and I've always gone to like the trade shows in New York for like Surtex and stuff. So anyway, um, and Martha Rich is an illustrator. She lives in Philadelphia also. And she's um, she's done so much for me. She's recommended me to clients. She's given me advice. Um, so I guess she would be my uh, mentor. Yeah, I, I would sort of say the same thing of just like getting involved in the illustration sort of scene and, and going to events, um, art shows and things like Icon. Um, and for me, it, it, there's lots of illustrators in Portland that I um, kind of talk with and we share kind of information back and forth. One of them is in this group right now, Ryan Bubness, great illustrator. Thanks for joining us. Ryan. Um, yeah, I think for me that like definitely uh, forming like a scene socially, um, which is like very easy depending on the city you're in. Um, obviously in Portland, in New York, there's like a full, like a very large infrastructure for illustration but even like before then just um social media is really good for that like reaching out to people and like you know for having like a more friendly dialogue but even a mentor based one I don't know like most people are, are more approachable than they might seem I think like I don't want to speak for everyone here but I, I imagine most of us like certainly myself included if you ever like have a question like don't hesitate to, re to reach out to someone say hey I'm a fan um I'm curious, like, uh, you know, can we have a chat if you're in the same city, like offer to take them out for coffee. Um, most illustrators like also like don't get to chat, don't, don't get to speak with people that often. We have relatively limited human contact. So um, yeah, um, you know, I think having mentors and having conversations are great and like, don't be shy about initiating them. I think, um when people think of mentors, like when I got started in my career, I, a lot of my mentors were older than me. Like I was like, how do you do this? Like, how do you do this editorial thing and stuff like that? And mentor is not necessarily someone who's older than you. It's just someone who has more experience. Like I thought for a while, I maybe wanted to do fabric design and I reached out to Julia Rothman and she was great about talking to me about how she got into it. So it's not always someone who's older than you. It's just someone who has more experience in a certain aspect of illustration than you do or like social media you know, stuff like that. I agree with Ilya. He just said um, to like talk with people because I feel like just take it easy. Um, everyone comes from somewhere, like everyone starts from the students or like I'm familiar with this industry. And also I agree with Melinda. He said a mentor is, they don't have to be like older than you. Uh, you can learn from like, a lot of people that they all have some aspect of them that um, the worst for you to learn something from. And to me, my mentor is um, the chair in SVA uh, MFA illustration project, Marshall Rizman. He really taught me a lot of things. And also my partner uh, that we founded um, a kids brand together. She works for, um, he used to be an interior designer, so he kind of like how to negotiate with a client and art business. So he is not like um, working illustration, and he has, yeah, um, he know very little about this industry. But you kind of feel like something is um, is similar. It works for our industry. That's true. Kate, okay, is there any more questions? I have a couple more and then I have some for myself <laughs> if, you're, if you're open to it. Um, another question from Jessica is, have you ever collaborated with another artist on a project? Nope. <laughs> I would like to, but I haven't. Yeah, not I either. I feel that's like maybe uh, on a commercial project, that's pretty unlikely to happen as like, 
as I showed you in my presentation, like that KFC project really only happened because I'd done something similar beforehand. So with like a lot of projects, like you're only going to be hired based on what you've already done. So if, so like, if you want to do like a collaborative commission projects, it's probably incumbent on you to uh, do collaborative work independent of anything commercially and just for fun. And then if enough people connect with it, that uh, often might come in. But I think it would just be a risky, th like it would probably be a risky thing for someone to reach out to like about out of the blue. Excepting of course, like collaborations between like, you know, sometimes your drawings will go with photography or like might go into, into animation or something. But I don't think that's what you mean, Jessica. Wow. Okay. I guess um, the, the thing I could add to that is um, not in terms of like integrating their artwork into it, but like, for instance, I did a mural that I had no experience doing one. So I re reached out to an artist friend who was more comfortable in that area and they helped me out. So. so uh, we're, Terry. All, we're, we're all a bunch of loners. Is <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> Okay. Terry, uh, during during your presentation, you talked about um, you created that postcard that you um, sold at Icon. Uh huh. And um, did the licensing company go to Icon, and that's how they they found that postcard, or how did you connect with the licensing company? So the postcard, um, I had uh, just I belonged to this thing called Found Artist. Um, uh, it's like a portfolio site, but they also do some other stuff like uh, promotional stuff, you know, if, if I request it and pay for it. Um, so they send out my postcards for me. So the icon came in because I had done uh, these stickers mm -hmm. to hand out instead of business cards at the icon in 2018, I think. And um, they like the the dogs and cats and t-shirts I just kept doing. And then Roger Laborde picked them up to do greeting cards. And that's the image I sent for a postcard. And that's the image that Gallison art director saw. Okay. Did that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then another question. So in all of your um, presentations, you kind of talked about how um, you, you got the work kind of from doing passion projects or you found the right community to engage like Jason with the with the brewery and um, Vicky with the children's um, products and, and collaborating with other children's product brands. Um, so am I, am I correct that like you're really finding the, the product you wanna work for and you're putting yourself out there and networking in that community? I would say, um, one thing I would say about, we had kind of had this discussion and people can jump in is, how do you meet people without it seeming like yeah. fake and schmoozy? Yeah. Um, <laughs> don't be fake and schmoozy. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, like, um, yeah, I don't do that. Like I just, um, you know, I do the regular stuff like everyone does, like um, send out mailers, do emailers, post on social media. Um, and then just just being around, like you just run into people who are like, oh, you're an illustrator, I need an illustration. Um, it just kind of happens. And doing passion projects that, you know, where it's for someone who really doesn't have money and it's, um, you know, or an organization that doesn't really have money, like you should never do a passion project for, um, a big company <laughs> and that doesn't that says like it's passion project we're not going to pay you you shouldn't do that but if it is really a small group of people or um they don't have money and you know you're going to have freedom i've done i do those and there's those are the ones that get into annuals usually and those are the ones that get me other jobs and so that's one way that i connect and do work that i like and get it out there yeah i um I think definitely, I mean, now that things are opening up a bit everywhere, including where, wherever I hope all of the audience is, um, I think that going out there and meeting people and, and 
including in contexts that are not uh, illustration based, like is great. Become like a, like Melinda, a polar bear, go swimming in the middle of winter. Um, I, yeah, that's really good. And also just always make sure that it's like, this is like easier said than done because I'm not very good at following, following this advice, but like always trying to focus on your personal work is like really, really important. And it's a great place where no matter what level you're at, you can tease out like different things and sort of, and, and like just as like that charity project uh, showed to KFC that I was able to work in that kind of style. Um, I'm kind of keen sometime soon to just for my own purposes to kind of make sort of textile like uh, exercises uh, just to put it out there that like that might be something I'm interested in doing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'd say a combination of all of those things. But yeah, never stop with the personal work, folks. It's how it's how you keep the fire burning. It's how you keep it passionate. And and it's also really good to have a relationship of with your work that isn't based on like either time or money. That's just based on like, you know, your space with the with the paper or with whatever material. Yeah, I totally agree. Me too. It's like no matter how many like um commission I have, I will save like one or two day a week for personal work. And um and I also think no matter how much they pay you, especially at the beginning of the career, I think once you say yes, you have to like put all your effort into it, focus on doing your best in each work. Because like Manina said, maybe it didn't pay you well, but you may get um, this work and bring into the like society annual, you got a medal and it worth it, especially for a, a beginner. I feel like um, it's a learning process uh, before maybe getting making benefits yeah at least for me um I would try to make each work better than the last uh, the last one and that's my goal and I feel like a good artwork can make your career go like deeper and lead you into some like amazing place you never thought of yeah it's your honesty and your effort put into the work that leads you to the next day, the next stop. Doing a, doing a good job is always the best promo. Like, <laughs> I, would, I would also add just, um, you know, being consistent. Like a lot of my clients find me on Instagram. I feel like that's been the biggest sort of promotion for my work and I, I post every day and that's the kind of thing Thing that keeps me to make more work and and always be you know doing my my personal practice that gets gets out there yeah whatever works like there are so many like there's no uh like one of the things that's really exciting about this industry but also deeply terrifying is that there's really like there aren't too many roadmaps. You kind of need to build your own career on your own terms. You know, it's not like, uh, you know, if you start at X law firm, you'll do like, like, you know, you'll be like a junior for like X number of years and eventually maybe become partner. Like, you know, we kind of need to make it up on the fly and like, uh, you know, follow changing tides and try out different things. But I think as long as you're like an effective thermometer of your own needs and as long as your like uh passion for your work remains hopefully things work out for the best hey we're at 7 30 kate yeah i think i think that would uh wrap it up yeah <laughs> Well, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you to our panelists and thank you for everyone to uh, all of our attendees for joining us tonight. This was an amazing conversation. I really enjoyed it. And all your work is very inspiring. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And thanks for Bye, joining. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks. 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 Thanks.